We got a Mohammedan customer. Are you ready? Glory to Jesus. We got a Mohammedan customer. Let's do it. Dirty. Bum. Bum. Now we got a customer. Hello? Yes, hi. Are you ready? Yeah. Good. You're the you're a Mohammedan that said you're gonna defend Islam, right? Yeah, uh you uh -huh. said um what yeah, you said that um what did I yeah, say? you said that sorry, in the previous live stream you what said I that say? um Islam teaches that uh uh like others like Jews and Christians will bear the sins of another. Yep, Sahih but... Muslim, open it up. Go to Sahih Muslim, go to Sunnah.com, don't play games now. Go to Sunnah.com, look up Sahih Muslim number 6665. In fact, I'm going to give you the link and you're going to read it, right? Okay, sure. But you're going to read it, right? You're not going to play games with me. You're not going to insult so we can keep respectful, right? I'm I, like I'm not the one insulting, but I know. Well, your prophet did insult. You, if you want to go there, don't let me show you where your prophet insulted people, cursed people, made an orphan girl cry. Don't play that game. Focus. Don't play the game with me. Been there, done that. Got the T-shirt. Hold on. Let me get it for you. Okay. okay sure. Let me get you. Sorry, Muslim. Six 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 five, and then a six 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 six. Okay. One second. So let me get it for you because I want you to read. I'll make it easy for you, my friend. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Okay, so did you um, get there? No, there's no. I don't want you to debate with me. I want you to read first. Then we're going to debate. Did you get there? Six, yeah, six, sure. six, five. Uh, yeah, it's open. Okay. And tell me what it takes you. Okay. Um. Yeah. Do you want me to read? You read it? it now. Read that. Six, 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 five. Okay. Uh, Abu Musa reported that Allah's messenger, uh, peace be upon him, said, uh, "When it will be the day of resurrection, Allah would." Uh, deliver to every Muslim, a Jew or a Christian, and say, uh, that is that is your rescue from hellfire. Now read the next hadith, 6666. Six, six, six. Okay, um, Abu, Bur uh, Abu Burdas uh, reported on the authority of his father that Allah's apostle said, no Muslim would die, but Allah would admit in his stead uh, a Jew or a Christian in hellfire. Uh, no. Umar took an oath by one, Besides whom there is no God, but he, thrice that his father, had narrated that to him from Allah's messenger. Now, read 6668. Okay, sure. Hold on. Yeah. I like it. You're being respectful, which is nice. So we can keep it respectful. Okay, so Abu Burda reported Allah's messenger as saying, there would come people amongst the Muslims on the day of resurrection with as heavy sins as a man, and Allah would forgive them, and he would place in their stead the Jews and the Christians. Did you finish uh, it? Finish yeah. it. Okay. Yeah, I finished it. Okay, so what did you just read? Allah's going to do to Jews and Christians? Uh, it, it looks like, uh, it sounds like uh, Allah is going to place the sins of Muslims on the Jews and Christians. So where was I lying? Sorry, what's that? Where was I wrong? Um, the the thing is that um, the Quran explicitly says that um, no one should bear the burden of another person's sin. Not and according to chapter the, five, verse twenty nine. No, that's not true. It's talking um, about Muslims who are burdened with sins. You will not carry each other's sins, but an unbeliever who's damned to hell, Allah will load the sins of Muslims on them. That's chapter five, verse twenty nine. That's what Abel told Cain will happen to him because Cain was an unbeliever, a murderer. And he says, and by murdering me, Allah will then place my sins on you and you'll be punished for your sins and mine. Chapter 5, verse 29, Surah Al-Maida. Open it up and read. Okay. Um, yeah, I have it right here. Um, read what Abel, by the way, if you want to read the context, don't start at 29. Read 27 to 32. Okay, sure. Relate to them in truth, O Prophet, the story of Adam's two sons, how each offered a sacrifice. Abel's offering was accepted while Cain was not. So Cain threatened, I will kill And by kill the way, where do you get the word Cain and Abel? It's not in the Arabic. Um, I'm reading um, like a like a physical copy of the Quran. Yeah. It's, uh, but you know in the Arabic, the word Cain and Abel are not there. Uh, but 
Uh, it doesn't mention that it's Adam's two sons. Yeah, but how, what are their names? If you follow the Quran, what are their names? It's Cain and Abel. Where does the Quran say it's Cain and Abel? Uh, uh, I'm not sure, but um, that, that's just how it was translated. Yeah, I just want to make sure that you know that the translation you're reading, it doesn't yeah. say Cain and Abel. The Arabic doesn't have Cain and Abel. That's some English that's inserting those words. And what are the Arabic names of Adam's son? It's not Cain and Abel. It's Habil, Kabil. Okay. So you know this, so, right? No. Okay, no. I thought you know this. Well, hold on. Are, how long you been a Muslim? Um, I just became a Muslim. Um, oh, like may Jesus Christ ago. save you. Then you made a big mistake, and you're on your way to hell. But may Jesus save you. That's good. There's still hope for you. Anyway, uh, you've been deceived. That's okay. Thank the Lord that He brought you here. Uh, number one, the Quran does not have the word Cain and Abel in the Arabic. Number two, the Arabic names for the sons of Adam in tradition, not in the Quran, is Habil and Kabil. I want you to go and ask your Imam, where in the world did you get Kabil as the Arabic name for Cain when Cain in Arabic is not Kabil? But just ask him, and I'll read now. Surah 5, 27 to 32. Keep reading. Okay, so I'll just continue. Um so Cain threatened, I will kill you. His brother replied, God only accepts the offering of the sincerely devout. If you raise your hand to kill me, I will not raise mine to kill you, because I fear God, the Lord of all worlds. I want to I want to let you bear your sin against me along with your other sins. Then you will be one of those destined to the fire, and that is the reward of the wrongdoers. Yet Cain convinced himself to kill his brother, so he killed him, becoming a loser. Then God sent a crow, digging a grave in the ground for a dead crow, in order... Sorry, yeah, uh, you, you, sorry can finish, you can finish uh, at 32, yeah. Yeah, then God sent a crow digging a grave in the ground for a dead crow in order to show him how to bury the corpse of his brother. He cried, alas, have I even failed to be like this crow and bury the corpse of my brother? So he became regretful. Yep, and read all the way 32. Okay, sure. Uh, that is why we ordain for the children of Israel that whoever takes a life, unless as a punishment for murder or mischief in the land, it will be as if they killed all of humanity. And whoever saves a life, it will be as if they they saved all of humanity. Okay, now. Although our messages, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, you, you can, that's fine. Now, what I want you to do, I just sent okay. you another link to an article I wrote about this passage. Click on it. Okay, sure. It's going to open up. When it opens up, let me know. Yeah. Okay. You see, I quote Abdullah Yusuf Ali, and I'm going to give you a link where you can read Abdullah Yusuf Ali online. You see it? The Where you see it, I quote this story in the Abdullah Yusuf Ali translation. You see? Yeah. Okay. You see the part where it says, for me, I intend to let thee draw on thyself my sin as well as thine. You see what Abel said uh, to Cain? It's right there oh, in yeah, bold. I put true. it all bold in capitals. Yeah, that's oh, right. Okay, so for me, I intend to let thee draw on thyself my sin as well as I'm meaning my sin will fall on you and your own sin. Okay, now, so again, you don't take my word for it. Scroll down. You're going to see I give you Pickthal and also Arbery. When you go to Pickthal and Arbery right there, you're going to see I quote 529.32. There in Pickthal, another Muslim translation says, Lo, I would rather thou shouldest bear the punishment of the sin against me meaning the sin that you will have to be punished for and my sin that i'd be punished for will be against you because then allah will not punish me for my sin and in case you still don't get it you see arbery i desire that thou shouldest be laden with my sin and thy sin you see that now, in case you still don't like these translations, I'm going to give you Tafsir al Jalalain online. Online, the two Jalals from a Muslim website. I want you to look at it. Here it is. Let me give it to you. So you don't take anything I say for granted. So you don't say, oh, he's a Christian, he's a liar. That's okay. You can say what you want. Click on that for me, James. Okay, sure. This is the two Jalal. They're Muslims. They're not Christians. They're not Jews. Yeah. Okay, now they're now telling you what the passage means. Can you read what they say? Okay, sure. Um, I desire that you should end up with my sin, the sin of slaying me, and your your own sin. Did you catch it? The one Before you move on, yeah. three things. My sin will fall on you, the sin of killing me will fall on you, and your own sin. Yeah. 
So do you now accept that according to the Quran, Allah can transfer the sins of a believer upon unbelievers whom he damns in hell? Um, it, it, it sounds like it from like what yes. you've shown me, but um, you're like, God knows best. Okay, that's fine. But it, you've already been brainwashed into saying Allahu Adam. What were you before you became Muslim? Uh, I was um, I was atheist, but my uh, my parents were Christians. And you broke your parents' hearts by becoming Muslim, huh? Uh, yeah. Oh, I so did. you admit? At least you admit. Well, hopefully, if you're still honest and open, you're going to go back to Jesus, Muhammad's Lord and, and Judge, not a Savior. It's too late for him. Now, I'm just going to use your Quran. I want to use your Quran. That's it. Now, hey, do you have your Quran ready? Yeah, I do. Okay. Um, go to chapter 4, verse 24 of the Quran, Surah okay. Nisa. We're just going to have discussion about your Quran. I'm going to use your Quran to show you that Muhammad is a person not worth you following and that even the Jesus of the Quran is better than Muhammad, even though I don't accept the Jesus of the Quran. But first, I got questions. You can go to your imam and have him call me. I'll have a discussion with him. But I want you to first see, so then you can ask, hey, imam, what's going on here? How come you didn't tell me these things? Chapter 4, verse 24, Surah the nisa 424. Read that for me. Um, okay, sure. Also forbidden are married women except female captives in your possession. This is God's commandment to you. Lawful to you are all beyond peace as long as you seek them with your wealth in a legal marriage, not in fornication. Uh, give, give those you have consummated marriage with their due diaries. It is permissible to be mutually gracious regarding the said diary. Surely God is all-knowing, all-wise. Okay, now you understand what this is. In verse 23, 24, yeah. it's telling you forbidden sexual relations, right? Here are the woman yeah, you I, can't touch, right? Yeah. Um, uh, when I, uh, I I did read the whole um, Quran like uh, this Ramadan, and when I got to like this verse, I understood it as um, as like a law, like uh, at its time, you know, that it's not. Um, it's what? That that it's a commandment from from God to, to do what? to the Muslims at the time, like at the time. Uh, where does prophet. it say at that time? So you mean right now you can have sex with a married woman because it's only for that time? Uh, no. Uh, no, but no, but that's your but, logic, James. No, but listen to before no, but, you come. I'm not trying to cut you off. Re okay. Repeat your logic to yourself. No, notice what you just said. Let me repeat your logic to you. This okay. command was for the Muslims at that time, but in this command, it's selling Muslims at that time. You can't have sex with a married woman. So if you're now going to be honest, it's only for that time they couldn't have sex with a married woman. That means they can now. Uh, no, but but I, I'm just trying to say that um, this these verses, like um, specifically these, were were given um, to the prophet at the time when he moved to Medina. So that there's like um, so that means very, uh, okay, let's situation. let's go with your logic. So when it tells you don't have sex with let's say your wife's daughter, that was only for that time. So now I can have sex with my wife's daughter. Uh, no. So even though it's given at that time, it still applies to all Muslims until the end, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, good. So now read to me 424 one more time. Okay, sure. The um, first part. Also forbidden are married women except the female captives in your possession. Are you okay with that? Because I just gave you a link. Click on Sunan Abu Dawood. Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2150 from sunnah.com, not the Christians. This is a click on it, and you see it's Sahih sound. Read it for us. Why was this verse revealed to your prophet? Okay. Um, Abu Said al Qutri said, uh, the apostle of Allah sent a military expedition to Atas on the occasion of the Battle of Hunayn. They met their enemy and fought with them. They defeated them and took them captives. Uh, some of the companions of the apostle of Allah were reluctant to have relations with the female captives because of their pagan husbands. So Allah, the exalted, sent down the Quranic verse, and all married women are forbidden unto you, save those captives whom your right hand possesses. This is to say that they are lawful for them when they complete their waiting period. Yeah, meaning to see if they're not pregnant. So let me be, be very honest with me. Don't lie and put on a show. So if the Muslims have a caliphate, let's say there's a legitimate khalif, Let's say, because you're waiting for the Mahdi to come. The Mahdi comes. The one that your prophet said will be from his bloodline. He'll reign for seven years. He'll unite the Muslims. His name will be Muhammad. 
And then yeah. he says, Muslims, let's attack the kuffar. They come and attack your place where your father and mother are alive. They take your mother captive. According to this verse, they can have sex with your mother. Are you okay with that? Um, no. Say it again? No. So are you okay that your prophet did it to other people's mothers and sisters and daughters at his time? You're okay with that? Um, no. Okay. And you became a Muslim in light of this? Uh, no, I didn't know about this. Okay. So now that you know how disgusting Muhammad is, when you're going to turn away and say, I made a mistake, I left the beautiful Jesus for this son of the devil. Okay, now that's that's just the beginning of your problems. Go to chapter 65 of the Quran. Okay, sure. 65 of the Quran. Yeah. Okay. I want okay. you to read verses 1 to 3 just to start with. Verses 1 to 3. Okay, sure. Um, o Prophet, instruct the believers when you intend to divorce women, then divorce them with concern for their waiting period. And count now, slow down so I can explain you. because the, the Imam obviously didn't explain this to you. Let me explain what you're reading. This is called the idda, the waiting period, when a man marries a woman and he has sex with her and he divorces her. The woman has to wait. It's called idda before she can remarry. So here it's talking about divorce and remarriage. How long is the waiting period for a woman who's been married, had sex with her husband, and divorced? Read it for me. Uh, is that, that's not mentioned in the first verse, is it? Read it in. Read it again. Read it slowly. Okay. That's why I said don't rush through. Read slowly. You're going to see. Okay, O Prophet, instruct the believers when you intend to divorce women, then divorce them. Divorce with women? Waiting. You caught it? Yes. Yeah. So it's about divorce. So then you divorce women, then what? Uh, then divorce them with concern for their waiting period and count it accurately and fear God your Lord. So it's a waiting period when you divorce them, right? Uh, yes. Okay, so that's the idda. We'll get there in a minute. Now keep reading, two and three. Okay, sure. Uh, do not force them out of their homes, nor should they leave unless they commit a blatant misconduct. Uh, these are the limits set by God, and whoever transgresses God's limits has truly wronged his own soul. You never know. Perhaps God will bring about a change of heart later. Okay, so this is uh, verse 2. Now, now then, read verse 3 slowly. Don't read fast because you're not going to understand what you're reading. Read slowly. Okay. Uh, do you want me to read verse 2? or? Yeah, read 2 and 3. And when you're finished okay. 3, then you're going to see why I'm telling you to read slowly. So you can understand what you're reading. Okay, sure. Uh, then when they have almost reached the end of their waiting period, either retain them honorably or separate for, from them honorably. And call two of your reliable men to witness either way. And let the witnesses bear true testimony for the sake of God. This is enjoined on whoever has faith in God and the last day. And whoever is mindful of God, he will make a way out for them and provide for them the sources they could never imagine. And whoever puts their trust in God, then he alone is sufficient for them. Certainly God achieves his will. God has already set a destiny for everything. Now you understand what it's saying. So after the waiting period, either you can take them back or you let them go and Allah will provide for the woman you've divorced. So you get the context now, right? Yeah. A woman who's been divorced has to wait. It's called the waiting period before she can remarry. That's known as yeah. the idda. Now, don't lose your place in chapter 65 because I want you to go to chapter 33, verse 49 of the Quran. Okay. Because you're going to see something because now I got another problem that you're going to have to explain to me. Um, okay. 33, so verse 33. 49. Okay, so uh, this is uh, 33, 49. Yes. Uh, all believers, if you marry believing women, and then divorce them before you touch them, um, they will have no waiting period for you to count. So read it one more time, suitable. slowly. Read okay. it one more time. Oh, you believers, if you marry women but have not touched them, do they have to wait? If you marry uh, believing women and then divorce them before you touch them, they will, have no, they will have no waiting period for you to count. So there is no waiting period, right, if you haven't had sex with them? Um, in, in the translation I'm reading, it, it, it says, if you marry believing women. Yeah, that's fine. We'll keep believing women. If I marry a believing woman, but okay. I have not touched her and I divorce her, does she have a waiting period or she's free? Uh, no, she doesn't have a, a waiting, waiting period. period, right? 
But then 65 versus one of three, what about those believing women that you did touch? Do they have to wait? Uh, yes. Okay, good. Now go to 65 verse four. Read for me 65 verse four. Okay, so as for your women, uh, as for your women past the age of menstruation, in case you do not know, their waiting period is three months. Okay, stop. And those Before, no, no, don't, don't go any further because you got to understand. If you have a woman that you're married and she's now menopause, she doesn't have periods. So how long should she wait? Three months, right? That's right. Yeah. But then read the next line slowly. Okay. And those who have not menstruated as well. As for those who are pregnant. Wait, you read it too period. fast. Why did you rush through that? And those who have not what? And those who have not menstruated as well. Well, whoa, 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 whoa. You're telling me your Quran saying that Muslim men can marry girls who haven't even menstruated, haven't had their periods? Uh, it's right there. Read it. You read it too fast, almost like you were scared to read it. Uh, yeah, I've, I've read it. It's, uh, yeah. yeah. And so please tell everyone you're okay with your God allowing men to marry minors, young girls, premature girls who haven't had periods, who haven't had their menstrual cycle, and have sex with men who will then be divorced for other men to sleep with. You're okay with that? Um, this is in your Quran. No. This is for all ages until the end. It hasn't been abrogated. Um, I don't know. So imagine you had a nine-year-old sister and a 30-year-old Muslim man wants to marry and have sex with her. And in Islam, Sharia, that's lawful. Are you okay with that? Um... Uh, no. You sure you're not okay with it? No. That, okay. What about right, but, uh, what about a 54 year old? A 54 year old no. man marries your nine year old sister and has sex with her while she's playing with dolls. Uh, no, but the. But the thing well, about, before you say but, are you okay with that? Uh, no, that that's not right. But um. But what? So it's okay for your Muhammad 54-year-old to sleep with nine-year-old Aisha. That's what you're going to say? No, I, I don't I don't believe that happened. I believe that she was at the, um, the age of maturity. You want to bet she's uh, not? She There's not a single hadith in Bukhari, Muslim, Sunan Abu Dawood, Tabari, Ibn Kathir, Qurtubi, that says what you said. They all say she was nine. She hadn't had her period, which is why she was allowed to play with dolls. Please don't deceive yourself. And I'll give you but, the hadith if you want. Hadith after hadith after yeah, hadith. I, I understand that, that there's these um, Sahih hadiths, right? But um, like uh, there, there's uh, scholars even today, like um, uh, I don't want to. I don't okay, but names, give but me they, one scholar. Here, here, let me do it. Don't give me a 20th century or 21st century scholar who's humiliated by what your prophet did. Quote to me a single scholar from the 8th century. 9th century, 10th century, 11th century, 12th century, 13th century, 14th century that said Aisha wasn't nine years old when Muhammad mounted her. Um, I, I, I can't quote any right now, but... Uh, uh, let me give you an article where you can't because I'll tell you what Ibn Kathir just said. I just gave you one article, sure. but let me give you another one. Ibn Kathir. You know why? They were not living at a time where the Kufar were the majority and they had social media. So they could be honest because they didn't give a damn what others said. They could kill them. But conveniently in the West, when the Muslims are outnumbered by unbelievers and media, oh, no, no, she was not. All of a sudden, she wasn't nine years old. Okay, well, let's see. Hold on. Okay, let's see. Now here... Here is the article where I quote all the major hadiths. All the major hadiths. Bukhari, Muslim, Sunan Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, and it's all online at sunnah.com. And I quote Tabari. Now, I'm going to send it to you, and I'm going to okay. ask you to do me a favor. Click on that link. Okay. Okay, click on that link. Do you see it says Yunus bin Bukhair? Yeah. Read it for us. Read that entire section. Slowly, sure. but please do it slow because if you go fast, you're not going to catch it. Okay, sure. Okay, Yunus uh, bin Bukair stated from Hisham bin Orwa from his father who said, the messenger of God 
uh, married Aisha three years after the death of Khadija. At that time of the contract, Aisha had been a had been a girl of six. When he married her, she was nine. How old? Uh, she was she was six when she got married. Uh, no, sorry. no, no, not when, when she, she was contracted nine. marriage six. When did he marry her? Uh, nine. Okay, now read. We'll keep reading. Okay, so the messenger of God died when Aisha was a girl of eighteen. Okay, keep going. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this tradition is considered a uh, uh, unique in this line, meaning it has a unique chain. But keep reading. Okay, sure. Um, Al Bukhari had uh, related from Ubaid bin Ismail, uh, from Abu Usama, from Hisham bin Urwa, from his father, who said Khadija died three years before the emigration of the Prophet. He allowed a couple of years or so to pass after that, and then he contracted marriage with Aisha when she was six. Thereafter, consummating marriage with her when she was nine years old. Okay, another one that says nine years old, another chain. Okay, now I'll read. Keep reading. Okay, what Orwa stated here is more, more, more soft. Soft. Yeah. Okay, incomplete as we mentioned above, but in its content, it must be judged as mutasil, uninterrupted, meaning that there is no flaw, no weakness. It is a perfect story. But keep, keep going. But anyway, forget what I'm saying because this is the paragraph I want you to read. Okay, uh, his statement, he contracted marriage with Aisha when she was six, thereafter made marriage with her when she was nine, is not disputed by anyone. Repeat that and again? As well as, it's not disputed by anyone. Now, let me tell you when Ibn Kithir wrote this. He wrote this 700 years after the death of your prophet in the 14th century. And he says, no one, no Muslim scholar, no jurist, no Hadith scholar disputes this. And I'll finish it. And it's well established, uh, well established in the Sahih collections of traditions and elsewhere. So why do you Muslim scholars in the 21st century, the century, dispute this when Ibn Kathir, 700 years after death of your prophet, said nobody, no Muslim scholar disputes this? So you guys trying to play games with us? Uh, keep reading. Uh, it. Keep reading. Okay, keep sure. reading slowly. Keep reading. Uh, he consummated marriage with her during the second year following the emigration to Medina. His contracting marriage with her took place some three years after Khadija's death, though there is disagreement over this. Yep. Uh, the, the Hafiz ya Yaqub bin Sufian stated Al Hajjaj related to us that Hamad related to him from Hisham bin Orwa, from his father from Aisha, who said, the messenger of God uh, contracted marriage with me after Khadija's death and before his emigration from Mecca when I was six years old. After we arrived in Medina, some women came to me while I was playing on a swing. My hair was like that of a boy. They dressed me up and put makeup on me, then took me to the messenger of God, and he consummated our marriage. I was a girl of nine. Are you okay with that? This is Aisha telling you. I had hair like a boy. I looked like a boy. I was playing on a swing, and then the messenger of God took me in, consummated marriage. Man, he had sex with me when I was nine. You're okay with that? You're okay with a 54-year-old taking a young girl who had hair like a boy, so she looked like a boy, being sent off after playing on swings to go in bed with a 54-year-old man who now is going to penetrate her. Tell me you're okay with this. Yep, I thought so. So here you have a religion that says, Men can marry girls who haven't had puberty and have sex with them and divorce them so other men can marry them. And then your prophet, who's 54 years old, had sex with a nine-year-old who's playing on swings, according to her testimony. But then it gets even worse. How old was Aisha when your prophet died? Uh, she was 18. So are you okay that your prophet left his wives, widows, Aisha was 18, never being able to marry ever again to have children because the Quran in chapter 33 verses 53 to 54 says that no one can marry any of the wives of Muhammad after his death. So not only did he take her when she's six and then have sex with her when she's nine, he then left her a widow at 18. She could never marry and have children and she lived way beyond her 50s and he left her in that condition. And you're okay with that? Tell, please tell me you're okay with that. Convince us you're okay with that because you left the beautiful Jesus 
the son of God who didn't rape anyone, who didn't sleep with any minor, whose apostles did not sleep with minors or take people captive and rape them. You left that Jesus for Muhammad. I just, I didn't believe that he was God. Why? Because you, you, you have every right to tell God what he can and cannot be? Really? Okay, now let's talk about Jesus and your Quran. Are you ready? Sure. Okay. Let's, since I already told about Muhammad, let's go to your Quran. Go to chapter 3, okay. verse 42 of the Quran. So, uh, 342? Yeah, of the Quran. Now we're going to talk about, now again, just for the record, James, I don't believe this is the real Jesus or the real Mary. But since you believe the Quran, you believe this is Mary and Jesus. That's fine. So we'll just go with it. Chapter 3, verse 42. I want you to read that for me. Okay. Um, and remember when the angel said, Oh Mary, surely God has selected you, purified you, and chosen you over all women of the world. Oh Mary, be devout to your Lord, prostrate yourself in prayer, and bow along with those who bow down. One more this time, read it. Read 342 one more time. Sure. Uh, and remember when the angel said, Oh Mary, surely God has selected you, purified you, and chosen you over all women of the world. He, wait, wait. Allah chose Mary and preferred her above all the women of the world? Uh, yeah, that's right. Okay, now that's. I have a question. Okay. You're aware that the only woman mentioned by name in the Quran is Mary, uh, Jesus' mother, Mary, right? That's right. You're aware that according to the hadith sahih muslim muhammad's mother is burning in hell right uh oh you didn't know this uh, you didn't no, know this no sir okay no. let me let me let me give you a muslim admitting this and i'll give you the hadith i'm going to give you a youtube clip asim he is a salafi muslim scholar who answers questions online i'm going to play it for you but first hold on uh, asim al-hakim i played it a couple weeks ago and then i'm going to give you the hadith from sahih muslim Okay. okay, well, let me just get it for you. So you can hear it from the horse's mouth. Okay. Okay, here you go. Let's get it. Okay. Here it is. I'm going to play it for you. Hold on. Why are the prophet's parents in hell? Asim al-Hakim posted December 13, 2020. Let me get you the link, and then I'm going to give you Sahih Muslim. I'm going to give you Sahih Muslim because he's going to quote Sahih Muslim. But first, let me get you the link so you don't think I'm making it up. So when I give you the link, click on it, but don't play it. I'm going to play it so people can hear it. Here it is. Okay. Click on that link so you know I'm not lying. All the links I gave you, save them and read them later in your comment. Okay. You see these links? Now click on the last one. But don't play it. Just pause okay, it. Sure. Okay. When it opens up, let me know. Yeah, it's open. Okay. Do you see the title? What does the title say? Read it for me. Uh, why are the prophet's parents in hell? And this is uh, a Jew or a Christian? Al Haki. Uh, this is, uh, I, I think he's a Muslim. Of course, Sheikh Asim Al Hakim. Now let's play him. Listen to him clearly. It's two. It's three minutes. Okay, let's listen. Sure. I'm playing him. Fourth question is, why are the parents of the Prophet ﷺ in hell? This question you do not ask me about. This question is something that the Prophet himself alayhi salatu wasalam, told us about and the hadith is in Sahih al-Imam Muslim. His father, a man came to him and said, O Prophet of Allah, where is my father? So the Prophet said, salam, your father is in hell. How did the Prophet know? Because Allah told him. So the man did not feel well about the answer. The Prophet said to him, your father and my father are in hell. And in another hadith, the Prophet wept one day, alayhi salatu So they asked him, why are you weeping? He said, I sought permission from Allah to seek forgiveness for my mother, and he denied me from seeking forgiveness for her, which means that in accordance to the ayah in Surah at tawbah that the Prophet and the believers are not permitted to seek forgiveness for those who died on idol worshiping, even if they were next of kin. End of story. Now, this was the Prophet's fatwa, alayhi salatu wasalam, not mine, not Sheikh XYZ. It was 
from the Prophet himself and it's not in a dubious book it's in Sahih Al-Imam Muslim the most authentic book alongside with the Bukhari after the Quran so why this is not our issue or problem because this is from Allah Azza wa Jal. it's a revelation you can say that maybe because the people of Mecca had the religion of Ibrahim this is why they were performing Hajj they were doing Tawaf and they had the original religion of Ibrahim of worshiping Allah on Tawheed and his son Ismail was their forefather and there was the religion of Judaism and Christianity which they had could have adopted anyone so these religion of monotheism were there but they failed to choose it so those who failed to choose it would end up in hell this might be a reason I don't know what I know is what the Prophet said to us والسلام, we have to believe and comply and Allah knows best so are you okay that Muhammad who you were deceived into thinking is the greatest man and the seal of the prophets his mother and father are burning in hell um, I, I didn't know about this but um, no are you okay I, I with it now how to explain this are you okay with it now um, I don't know okay now I just gave an article I wrote on this you see it says Muhammad's family in hell uh, yeah click on it okay and you're gonna to go to the hadith and the hadith I give you the link where you read it online so the Christian the Muslims say oh Sam he's a kafir he's this and that don't trust him Allah damn him what I want you to do is you put command F and you put Sahih Muslim and it's gonna take you to the hadith when you find it let me know um, yeah sure there's okay you, yeah I found it okay okay now click on the link where it says HTTPS colon sunnah.com you see it yeah uh, what there's is, uh, there's many of those like, okay but the one the one the one the one you're gonna see it's gonna say it's gonna say uh, uh, 36 chapter the Prophet asked his Lord permission to visit the grave of his mother click yeah, uh, keep going until you get there did you get there yeah, I'm here. Okay, now I give you the link to sunnah.com where you read the hadith on the sunnah site, not my article, because someone say, oh, it's this article, he's lying. Click on that where it says HTTPS sunnah.com. Sure. Okay, what did it take you to? Uh, I'm at uh, sunnah.com, the book of prayers. Okay, you read notice. it. Read the hadith. Sure. Uh, Abu Huraira reported the lost messenger as saying, I sought permission to beg forgiveness for my mother, but he did not grant it to me. I sought permission from him to visit her grave, and he granted it permission to me. Now you got it, right? So the sheikh wasn't lying. I'm not lying, right? Uh, yeah. Okay, so Muhammad's mother is burning in hell. Now go back to the article. Go back to the article. Okay, sure. When you get there, you're going to go to the hadith about his father. I'll tell you where it is. Let me just get there. You're going to keep scrolling till you get to, it says chapter 86, he who died with unbelief. When you get there, you'll okay. find it. You see it? Yeah, I see it. Click on the link, searchtruth.com. Click on it. Okay. Okay, it opened up to search. This is a Muslim site that has Sahih Muslim. Read for me 0398. Sure. Um, Anas reported, uh, verily, a person said, Messenger of Allah, where is my father? He said, he is in the fire. When he turned away, he, the Holy Prophet, called him and said, verily, my father and your father are in the fire. So are you okay that Muhammad's father is burning in hell and his mother is burning in hell, but Jesus' mother is the greatest woman that God created? Let me ask you another question. If Jesus is just an ordinary man, like Muhammad, why is Jesus' mother the greatest woman, but Muhammad's mother is in hell and his father is in hell? What makes Mary so great if Jesus is simply a man? As you're thinking about that, since you're in the Quran, let's go now to chapter 19 of the Quran, Surah uh, Maryam, a chapter named after Mary. All of this the Muslims won't tell you. They're going to hide it from you to deceive you, which is why Satan duped you into following the son of the devil. I pray you come back to Jesus who loves you and died for you. Muhammad didn't die for anyone. He murdered people's children, whereas Jesus died for you. 
Go to chapter 19 of the Quran. And you left this beautiful Jesus who left heaven for you. And I go to chapter 19 of the Quran when you get there. Let me know. Okay. Yeah, I'm here. Read 16 to 19. Verses 16 to 19. Chapter 19, read verses 16 to 19. Sure. Uh, and mention in the book, O Prophet, the story of Mary when she was, sorry, when she withdrew from her family to a place in the east, screening herself off from the. Then we sent to her our angel Gabriel appearing before her as a. And by the way, it doesn't say angel Gabriel, but that's okay. I don't care about that. That's a mistranslation. Just let's say it's angel Gabriel. That's fine. Keep going. Okay, sure. Uh, appearing before her as a man perfectly formed. She appealed. I truly seek refuge in the most compassionate from you. So leave me alone if you are God fearing. He responded, I am only a messenger from your Lord, sent to bless you with a pure son. Wait, Jesus she is what? Jesus is a pure son. And yet Muhammad in the Quran is a sinner whom Allah threatened to kill and disgrace. Do you know that? I I don't believe Muhammad's sin. Okay, now I'm gonna show you that you don't believe the Quran. Go to chapter nine, verse forty three of the Quran. Okay. Your your Quran is your enemy. Okay, go to chapter 9, verse 43. Okay, sure. Um, I'm going to read 943. Mm -hmm. uh, may God pardon you, O Prophet. Why, pardon why who? Did you give them wait, wait, wait. Pardon who? Uh, the Prophet. Why? Why does he need to be pardoned if he didn't sin? Can you show me where uh, the Quran says, May Allah forgive you, O Jesus? Yeah, I've um, I've read uh, I've read the Quran and um, Dr. Kitab who translated this Quran um, actually leaves a footnote um, in one of the chapters. I'm not sure. But before but you ask me the footnote, is Kitab uh, a messenger who received wahi from Jibril? Uh, no, no. Okay, but, um, just go with the verse. That the no, the just go with the I know, br uh, brother in humanity. I know what they're going to tell you. I didn't care what they say. Why is your God saying to him, "May God forgive you"? Forgive him for what? It says pardon you. Okay, pardon you for what? It, it, as I said, like um, it could be for misjudgments that um, he, like he could have. So then he's a, not a pure, is he? Like Jesus, right? Sorry, what's that? Then he's not pure like Jesus, right? Whether a mistake or a sin, I'm going to show you he committed a sin. But still, Jesus is pure, and God never said, "I pardon you." But your prophet is impure who needs to be pardoned. Now go to chapter, well, forget chapter, go to chapter 47, verse 19. 47, 19? Yes. Okay, so this is 47, 19. Yes. So know well, O prophet, that there's no God worthy of worship except Allah and seek forgiveness for your shortcomings. Wait, why does Muhammad sin? need to seek forgiveness for anything? Um, yeah, so there's a footnote here by Dr. Kitab. It says, yeah. like other prophets, Muhammad was infallible of sin. The verse here refers to misjudgment. Such where? As where does the verse say misjudgment? Um, no, but uh, he gives an example given in uh, chapter 80, verses yes. 1 to 10. If the prophet himself is urged to seek forgiveness, then the believers... Okay, are but that's going to backfire against you. Chapter 80 is about Muhammad frowning on a blind man to appease a rich man. And you're telling me that's not a sin? Can you show me where Jesus frowned on a blind man, ignored a blind man in order to make the rich Jews happy? Uh, no, Jesus never sinned. Okay, but my point is, the example that your katab, that you're following as if he's a messenger buries Muhammad because in chapter 80 verses 1 to 10 I know what he's referring to it says he frowned your prophet frowned on a blind man made a blind man feel bad because your prophet was busy trying to appease a rich Arab pagan when a blind man came asking his advice and you're okay with that um yeah I did read about that and I did read that um that uh when when he uh, Muhammad did that um there was a whole uh, chapter there's a whole story yeah chapter that 80 climate. that's the one chapter 80 what katab is referring to so you're yes, okay I, you're okay that your prophet frowned on a blind man made him feel bad because he was busy trying to appease a rich arab pagan just tell me you're okay no that's that's not okay but muhammad himself okay. said that he felt bad and 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 allah oh, so uh, it was a sin a surah about the blind man oh so, so allah revealed the surah showing that your prophet made a mistake by making a blind man feel like garbage, something Jesus never did. Thank you for admitting that. Yes, Allah revealed a surah 
um, about the prophet's misjudgment. Just repeat it again because we're hearing you. You just admit to everyone, Muhammad frowned on a blind man, made a blind man feel so bad and worthless because your prophet was too busy trying to appease a rich Arab pagan to convert, and your God rebuked him for that misjudgment, whereas Jesus never made any blind man feel bad, but actually healed them according to your Quran. But Excellent. This is, you don't have to bring up like uh, Jesus, like um, yes, Jesus I do. Him, but I have to bring Jesus because Jesus, your Quran says, is pure, and unlike your prophet, he healed the blind man. He didn't make blind people feel like garbage. Go to chapter three, verse forty-nine. Okay. Sure. So unlike your Muhammad in the Quran, who made blind people feel like garbage, Jesus healed them. Go to chapter three, verse forty-nine. Okay, I'm going to read uh, 49. Um, and make him a messenger to the children of Israel to proclaim, I have come to you with a sign from your Lord. I will make for you a bird from clay, breathe into it, and it will become a real bird by God's will. I will heal the blind and the leper and raise the I will heal who? Uh, the blind. And your prophet made a blind man cry. Okay, at least you admit that. I'm, I'm glad. Now, let me show you how wicked your prophet is because you say he didn't make any mistakes. Go to 33, 37 of the Quran. Chapter 33, verse 37. Okay. Um, so this is 33, 7. 33, uh, verse remember, 37. Verse 37. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, and remember when we took a covenant from the prophet? No, 33, well as, verse 37. You keep reading 7. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Okay, so this is uh, the case of Zayd. Um, Zayd, and remember, O Prophet, when you said to the one for whom God has done a favor, and you too have done a favor, keep your wife and fear God while concealing within yourself what God was, sorry, what God was going to repeal. And so you were considering the people, whereas God was more worthy of your consideration. So when Zayd totally lost interest in keeping his wife, we gave her to you in marriage so that there would be no blame on the believers for marrying the ex-wives of their adopted sons after their divorce. And God's command is totally binding. Now, please convince us you're okay with your prophet marrying his adopted son's wife, who for a season was his daughter-in-law. Let me give you an example of what I mean. You're my adopted son. You got married. You divorce okay. her, and then I marry her, and she becomes your stepmother. So you're okay now with your ex-wife being your stepmother, a woman that you saw naked and slept with, who's now sleeping with your dad, who's now your mother. You okay with that? Can I say something? Yes. Uh, I want to say that, um, like in the, in the time of like uh, the seventh century, in the time of the prophet, and at um, like uh, in Arabia itself, like um, they had different like um, traditions and cultures. Like you can't like impose. Like, um, you yeah, know, you're going to embarrass I yourself with that I argument, right, James? What, I wouldn't do what you just described right there. but James, um, you're going to embarrass yourself by saying that because your prophet is supposed to be an example for all generations, not just the seventh century. And didn't your prophet destroy certain customs that people observed because they were bad? Uh, yes, he did. Oh, but he, but he kept this custom that was evil. How convenient. So let me ask you the question again. Would you be okay with your adoptive father taking your divorced wife and marrying her, a woman that you had naked in bed and was having sex with, who's now your mother, and you have to honor as your mother? Uh, no, that's not okay. Uh, okay. Like, I wouldn't do anything like that. But Okay, but no, uh, hold on. Did your prophet then abolish adoption after he married his daughter-in-law? I believe adoption is ado uh, abolished. Oh, and you have no problem. So now help us understand your logic. Your prophet married his adopted son's wife to be an example okay. for other people, to be an example for other people so they can marry their adopted son's wives when they're divorced. But then shortly okay. after that, he then abolished adoption. Didn't Allah know he was going to abolish adoption? I'm sorry, but did he abolish adoption? Or yeah, did he did. Abol Allah abolished it according to you. So your God, who's not the God revealed in Jesus, because the God revealed in Jesus doesn't abolish adoption. He adopts children. But your God that you decided to follow abolished adoption. And you're okay with that? So this humane practice of adoption, Allah got rid of, but marrying your adopted son's divorced wife, he, he was okay with it. 
So something immoral he was okay with, but something humane he abolished. Yeah, you make sense, uh, James. I'm ready to take shahada. Uh, but, um, yeah, so uh, adoption is um, abolished, but um, that doesn't mean that um, Muslims can't take in like um, like straight children into their families. You can't, and, when um, they're old enough, you can't have them in your house because of your women folk cannot freely mix with those who are not forbidden for them. Don't let me bring up breastfeeding as an example, where Muhammad had a woman suckle a grown man with her tit because he had abolished adoption and her husband is now uncomfortable with him in the house because there was nothing forbidding him from lusting for his wife. So Muhammad said, let him suck your tit and now he'll be your foster son. You don't want to open that can of worms, do you? So uh, let, me, but, uh, let me ask the question again because you went far afield. Didn't your God Allah know that he was going to abolish adoption right after Muhammad was going to marry Zayed's wife? Um, I, I don't understand. He, he did abolish adoption. No, you're not. No, he didn't abolish it when your prophet married her. 33, 37 just told you the reason yeah, why he right. married her was to be an example for other people to marry their adopted son's wives. Did you just read 33, 37? Read it. It's right there. Okay, so we gave her to you in marriage so that there would be no blame on the believers for marrying the ex-wives of the of of adopted sons. Okay, so at that time when your prophet did it, adoption was still allowed, right? Uh, yes. So, but didn't your God Allah know that he was then going to abolish adoption? Um, yes. God. God so why did he allow Muhammad marry his adopted son's wife when he knew he was going to abolish adoption? So that this example, Muhammad, is meaningless because it can't be an example for anyone anymore. There's no more adoption. Yeah. Um, can I say something? Yeah, go ahead. Um, it, um, like throughout the Quran, like um, there are many revelations that um, that uh, it's not to say long, like they're not relevant anymore, but they get um, like superseded by like better revelations from God. You mean it's and better so to abolish adoption, a humane practice, but it was... <clears throat> Not as good to then lust for your adopted son's wife who then ended up divorcing her so you can marry her. So now it's better to abolish adoption. That's better to get rid of adoption. That's better. I want you to say it again. Getting rid of adoption, robbing children of having a, a father or a mother that they can look to because Allah abolished adoption. That's better. Please say it's better. Yes, my God did what was better. He abolished adoption, leaving hundreds of thousands of orphans without the opportunity to be adopted and call anyone mommy and daddy or barren parents, women who can't have children, robbing them of the opportunity of adopting a child and calling that child son or daughter because that's better, much better what your God did. Can you say that, please? I want to hear it. I want it recorded. Now go to Romans chapter 8 to show you the true God buries your God because your God is not the true God. Open up your Bible. I, you have your Bible? Yeah, I do, but I, I don't I don't believe in the Bible. Uh, well, your prophet did, so that means you're better than your prophet. So go um, to cha Romans that, chapter 8. Okay, sure. And I'm going to show you how good. Jesus now buries your God and prophet as adulterers and murderers, the very Bible that you're afraid of. But go to Romans 8. Read 14 uh, to 17. Romans, Romans was written by Paul, not Jesus. Okay, but and the Quran was written by Muhammad, not Jesus. And you still believe what Muhammad says about Jesus? Yes. I yes. Oh, wait, wait. Say it again. So, yes, I believe what Muhammad, who came 600 years later, tells me about Jesus in Arabic, a language Jesus didn't speak. But Paul, who met the eyewitnesses of Jesus, I don't trust them. You see how stupid you sound, James? But... Uh, there's there, there are things in the in the Bible that you can't fully trust, like uh, like. What oh, you mean like your really prophet? Your prophet telling you you can marry a minor who has in puberty that you can trust. Your prophet marrying his adopted son's divorced wife that you can trust. Your prophet abolishing adoption that you can trust. Your prophet saying take married captive women and rape them that you can trust, but we can't trust Paul. You make sense, man. I'm ready to go to the mosque take shahada. Go to Romans eight. Read verses 14 to 17. Okay, sure. It's um this is Romans 8 14. Yeah, verse verse 14 to 17. Okay, so for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. 
uh, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Slowly. Rather, the spirit. Okay. Keep on. Uh, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption. What? What did it do? It brought about what? A dark, but this is talking okay, about no, no, this, no, like the Calm down. Sins. Don't get, be afraid. I know the Bible scares you because the demons that are controlling you, but may Jesus set you free. So the God that spoke to Paul loves adopting children. Your God hates adoption and abolished it. So is Allah your father? Um, is Allah no, your Allah father? Is not, Allah is not, uh, God is not a father, but this. But this Jesus says about, God is the father. Wait, wait. Jesus said God is the Father. So are you sure your Jesus, Allah is the God revealed in Jesus? Jesus never said that in the Quran. And uh, that's why we don't believe your Quran. It's trash because it lies about what Jesus said. Okay, but um, this passage right here yes. uh, from, from Paul, it's talking about um, adoption in a, in a spiritual sense. You know? Yes, but there is no adoption spiritually or legally in Islam. You can't be adopted as a son of Allah and you can't adopt a child legally. So your Quran destroys adoption spiritually and legally. What don't you get? What don't you get? So I want you to say in front of everyone, Allah is my father and he adopted me as a son and Muhammad is the son of Allah spiritually. Say that. I want to record you. Say it. No, I can't say that. Okay, now you just said that Muhammad is of the devil because he's not from the same God that Jesus proclaimed. Let's put Paul aside. I never said that. No, I'm saying that's what you're saying without you realizing it. Now go to Matthew 6. Let me show you what the true Jesus said about God. Go to Matthew 6. Read verse 6. All the way to eight. I don't I don't believe in the authenticity of Matthew. But your fake prophet did. Are you saying you're better than Muhammad? If I show you from your Quran that your prophet said, believe the Bible that I have, are you going to spit on him with me? Because I'm going to show you that right now in the Quran. No. Okay. May I explain? Um, no, don't, I, I, I don't something? need your explanation. You just became a Muslim two months. You're not qualified. Do you want me to show you in your Quran where your fake prophet said, my Bible is true and I'm to use it to judge him? And then you can spit on him yes, with me. It does it does say that you, ah. you have to judge by the Torah and the gospel, but that was at the time of the prophet. And okay, the what prophet? What 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 prophet? The the prophet Muhammad. And okay, now, time, now you see now you're a liar or you're ignorant because you have copies of the Torah that were written before Jesus, after Jesus, during the time you're prophet, and it's the same we have today. So when did it change? Um, I, I believe it's changed after the, the Prophet Muhammad. That's okay, good. I'm an, oh, good, good. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Prophets. Good, good. Because now I'm going to give you an English translation of the copy of the Old Testament from copies of the Bible that were in 200 years before Jesus. So, good. Now let me show you that. Now you're stuck. You said after, right? Okay, let me give you a translation from before. Good, good, good. One second. Let me get the Dead Sea Scrolls. We were saying it Thank you. You just destroyed Muhammad. Okay. Here it is in English. Here it is. There you go. Okay, I want you to see this right here. The Dead Sea Scrolls Bible, the oldest known Bible translated for the first time into English. This is the Torah from the most ancient copies of the Old Testament written in Hebrew, found in 1947, written about 20 years before Jesus, translated in English, and it's identical to what I read in my Bible today, and this is before Muhammad. So you said after Muhammad, now I got copies before Muhammad. You're stuck. Okay, so um, with the whole um, Bible uh, from the time of Jesus or before him, uh, peace be upon him, um, we're, we're not sure. I mean, I, I'm not sure. I don't know. Like, Go to how, chapter 3, like, verse 50. Better. You better be sure. Go to chapter 3, verse 50, because your Quran says Jesus confirmed what I'm holding right now. Go to chapter 3, verse 50 yeah. of the Quran. Yeah, I know I know what you're saying. Okay, to read it. If you know, to read it. Chapter 3, okay, verse sure. 50. Okay, so this is... a. Uh, uh, 350 and I will confirm the Torah revealed before me and legalize some of what had been forbidden to you I have come to you with a sign from your Lord. So be mindful of God and obey me Okay, he's gonna do what what did uh, your Quran say Jesus supposedly did? 
Jesus confirms the Torah given to Moses. Okay, now I'll give you $10 million. Show me where it says the Torah is given to Moses in your Quran. Look, um, Allah says that a book was given to Moses, and we know the book given no, no, to Moses. No, no, you're not listening. No, 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 you don't know. You don't know what the book is because the Quran doesn't tell you. Don't play that game with me. Don't steal from my Bible to defend your position because you just rejected my Bible. Show me in your Quran where it says the Torah was given to Moses. Don't play that game with me, son. Um, I, I can't think. Of, I can't think of a verse on top of my head because there isn't. So what I'm not going to let you do is steal from my Bible, which tells you the Torah is given to Moses because you just said you don't believe it because that means you're a hypocrite like your prophet to go to my Bible to tell me that the Torah is given to Moses. But then when I use my Bible, I don't believe it. You don't play that game. Either you accept it or you reject it. So I want you to show me in your Quran where it says the Torah was given to Moses. Right now, show it to me. You don't need to waste your time. It's not there. But what I want you okay. to look at is, what did Jesus do? Jesus confirmed the Torah. Okay. Did it say that he exposed corruption to the Torah or he confirmed it? No, he confirmed the Torah. Okay. Now, go to chapter 5, verse 46. Okay, so this is uh, 546. Yep. Uh, th then in the footsteps of the prophets, we sent Jesus, son of Mary, confirming the Torah revealed before him. And we gave him the gospel, containing guidance and light, and confirming what was revealed in the Torah, a guide and a lesson to the God-fearing. So let the people of the gospel judge by what God has Now you went to 47. Him. Well, read 47. Go ahead, read. It's okay. I wanted you to read just 46, okay. but read 47 since you read it. Sure. So let the people of the gospel judge by what God has revealed in it. And those who do not judge by what God has revealed are truly the rebellious. Okay, now go to 61 verse 6 of your Quran. And I'm not even going to quote Ibn Kathir. We don't need Ibn Kathir to confirm what I'm saying. Just you're reading in front of your eyes with this Khatib guy. Read 61 verse 6. Sure. And remember when Jesus, son of Mary, said, O children of Israel... I am truly God's messenger to you, confirming the Torah which came before me, and giving good news of a messenger after me whose name will be Ahmed. Yet when the prophet came to them with clear proofs, they said, this is pure magic. Okay, now, I just gave you three verses which you read. Jesus confirmed the Torah that was there in his possession. Not a single word about Jesus saying it's corrupted. Now, I just showed you. Look at the title again. The Dead Sea Scrolls Bible, the oldest known Bible translated for the first time into English. Archae archaeological proof tells us what the Torah was because we found manuscripts in Hebrew of the Torah, the Old Testament, written before Jesus. That means if you believe in your Quran, the only Torah Jesus had historically, this is a fact, is what I have today, and it's right here. So if you believe in your Quran, you better stop telling me I reject your Bible because that means you don't believe in your Quran. So coming back to the issue, whether you believe the Bible or not, forget that you believe the Bible. Let's say you don't believe the Bible. It's corrupted. Fine. But you're not okay. addressing the fact that I, as a Christian, when I read the Bible, I see that the God of the Bible wants Christians to adopt children because he's a God who loves to adopt people into his family. Your God, Allah, not only abolishes adoption, you can't adopt. He doesn't adopt anyone. How can they be the same God? I, I convince me I want to be Muslim convince me someone who's been raised on the Bible that Muhammad it believes in the same God that Jesus believed in and when you tell Muhammad me the Bible's corrupt by the way when you tell me Bible corrupt you're proving to me Muhammad is a fake you know why because you wouldn't tell me the Bible's corrupt if Muhammad agreed with the Bible but you see he doesn't agree with the Bible so you have to attack the Bible to deceive me into following him okay but um, there are things in the in the Old Testament that um, the, that you and the New Testament authors um, like interpret things like like from a Christological point of view. So uh, why not use the Quran as the criteria? Because Allah says in the Quran. Why would I use the Quran as a criteria a, when your Quran in chapter because, five just said? Well, listen. Did you read it? You didn't read it. It said we Christians are to judge by the gospel, not the Quran. Did you read five forty seven? You just refuted yourself. Uh, read it again. Yeah, I did read it. Um, okay, yeah, so just, as a Christian who's not a Muslim, what am I supposed to judge by according to your Quran? As according to the Quran, it's uh, read it. 
so let the people of the gospel judge by what God has revealed in it. What's it? And those who do not, it is the gospel. Okay, so why did you just tell me, use the Quran as a criterion, when your Quran is telling me, a Christian, use my gospel as a criterion? Um, now read 45, same chapter, 45 to 4, I'm sorry, 43 to 45. Read chapter 5, verses okay. 43 to 45. Okay, can I can I say something about um, this? Um, it, it did say that um, you should judge by by the gospel, uh, uh, by what God has revealed in the gospel. But um, Allah also says that to not go extremes um, in in what you do. I don't care what Allah the Quran says. says because that's not the gospel. My gospel doesn't care what Allah says. But your Allah told you to tell me to judge by my gospel. Is that what your Allah just told you to tell me? Uh, yeah, it seems like so Allah don't tell me James listen don't tell me what your Allah says to you I don't give a damn I'm telling you that you're supposed to tell me because Allah told you to tell me you Christian judge by your gospel So I'm judging you by my gospel Now read 40 43 to 40 45 to see that then your Allah tells the Jews don't go to Muhammad Go to your Torah and judge by it read 43 to 45 same chapter Okay, sure. Uh, but why do they come to you for judgment when they already have the Torah containing God's judgment? Then they turn away after all. They are not true believers. Indeed, we revealed the Torah containing guidance and light by which the prophets who submitted themselves to God made judgment for Jews. So too did the rabbis and scholars judge according to God's book with which they were entrusted and of which they were made keepers. So do not fear the people, fear me, nor trade my revelations for a fleeting gain. And those who do not judge by what God has revealed are truly the disbelievers. We ordain for them in the Torah a life for a life, an eye for an eye, a nose for a nose, an ear for an ear, a tooth for a tooth, and for for wounds equal in retaliation. But whoever weighs it charitably, it, it will be atonement for them. And those who do not judge by what God has revealed are truly the wrongdoers. Okay, can I ask you a question? You read sure. 43 to 45. It even says to the Jews, why are the Jews coming to you, Muhammad? Let them stick with the Torah. So why are you now telling me and the Jews to judge by your Quran when your Quran tells you to tell me, Christian, you judge by your gospel. Jew, don't come to Muhammad, judge by your Torah. So why are you contradicting your Quran? Um, when when I read these verses, I understood it as the, like the Torah and the gospel as being not corrupted yet at the time of the prophet. Oh, so when now I when I gave you copies of the Torah, that were discovered in 1947 that were written before Jesus showing you that the only Torah that Jesus would have confirmed is what I have today and even proves it to you because in 45 it says in the Torah there's life for life tooth for a tooth that verse is still in my Torah it's in Exodus 21 22 to 25 so the very verse in 545 quoted it's there in what I read today game over friend that means your attack on the Bible means you're dishonest or ignorant, one of the two. I'm going to be generous and say you're ignorant because you didn't know much about Islam, let alone about the Bible. You know nothing about the Bible and know very little about Islam. And it's just being honest. So now if I judge according to the gospel, I'm going to do what your Quran says. You Christian, Nasara, judge by your gospel. Okay, James, my gospel says God is the father of believers spiritually. We are his children through faith in Jesus. Jesus said God is the father. I read your Quran. Allah is a father to no one. Muhammad is in, his, is in his son and you're not his son. Then how can the God that Jesus preached about in my gospel be your God? Um, I, I'm not sure. Say it again. I'm not sure. Okay, good. Hopefully God will wake you up from your deception and you come back to Jesus. But let's put the Bible aside. I'm still not done okay. talking about Jesus in your Quran. I just want to talk. And remember, you believe in the Quran. You believe this is Jesus. So I want to ask you questions about your Jesus of your Quran because I don't believe it's the real sure. Jesus. But still, we first saw Jesus' mother is the only woman mentioned by name in the Quran. You also saw Jesus' mother is the greatest of all women, chapter 3, verse 42. You then read and heard a sheikh tell you Muhammad's mother is in hell and his father is in hell. Let's put that aside. Then you read, then you read that Jesus is pure. Whereas even if we go with you, Muhammad made mistakes and he needed to be pardoned and forgiven. 
still showing that Muhammad, according to your Quran, is not even on the level of Jesus. Not even on the level of Jesus. Okay, now let's put that all aside. I want you to go to chapter 38 of the Quran and read for me 71 and 72. Sure. Okay, so this is 3871? The 72, Remember, your Quran. Okay. Remember, O Prophet, when your Lord said to the angels, I am going to create a human being from clay. So when I fashioned him... Slowly, and you keep reading spirit, fast. If you read fast, you're not going to catch what you're reading. Slowly. I'm going to create from clay a human being, right? That's right. Allah creates um, a human being. He created Adam from clay. Okay, keep reading. So when I fashioned him and had a spirit of my own um, creation breathed into him. Yeah, by the way, that's not what the Arabic says. The Arabic doesn't say a spirit of my own creation. It says, and when I breathed into him my spirit. That's right. Dr. Kathab added um, in. Yeah. Uh, so do me a favor. Sorry. Forget his additions. Just read what the text says. And when I breathed into him of my spirit. Okay, sure. So when I fashioned him and had a spirit of my own, breathe into him, fall down in prostration to him. Okay. I'm going to come back to them bowing down to Adam. But now Allah created Adam from clay, breathed the spirit into Adam, Adam became life, right? That's correct. Okay, now go to 349 of the Quran, chapter 3, verse 49. Chapter 3, verse 49. Yeah, so this is 349, yep. and make him a messenger to the children of Israel to proclaim, I have come to you with a sign from your Lord. I will make for you a bird from... Now, before you move on, in... before you move on, yep. the word make in Arabic is from the same verb, khalaqa. It's the same verb, khalaqa. Do I need to show you the Arabic transliteration, or do you take my word for it? Um... The same verb uh, that used know. up... Oh, okay, okay, well, here, let me get it to you. Hold on, hold on. let me get you the link. So you, because I want you to check it out. Hold on, uh -huh. Let me get you, and you don't need to read Arabic, it's in transliteration. Let me just get okay. it for you, because I need to show you this, because unfortunately, your Muslim translations don't do it for you. Okay, here is Quran Browser Online. That's what I want you to do, and I'm going to give it to everyone. Quran Browser Online, here it is. I want you to click on it when I give it to you, and I'm going to tell you how to use this, okay? You see it? Yeah. Click on it. it. Okay, now. When you click on it, tell me if it opens up. Um, yes, it did. Now, put in 3 colon 49. Sure. And then put in 5. You got to put a space. You put 3 colon 49, semicolon, semicolon, okay. space, 5 colon 1110, right? Uh, 1110? Yes, Sorry. chapter 5, verse 110. Oh, okay. So it should pop up. Now, when it pops up, it's going to give you multiple translations, and it's going to give you transliterated Arabic, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. When you go to the transliterated Arabic, you're going to see it says, Ani Akhluku, Akhluku, A-K-H-L-U-Q-U. Yeah, that's right. That's from the verb Khalaqa. It means create. That's why, read Arbery, see how he translates it. Read Arbery. Sure. Uh, to be a messenger to the children of Israel, saying, I have come to you with a sign from your Lord. I will create for you. I will create for you. What will he That's create? Right. Keep reading. Um, yeah. Hold on, my friend, my connection. Hold on. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, okay. So it says, I will create for you from clay the likeness of a bird, right? That's right. Now, okay, so I will create from you, for you, from clay, a bird, and then what? Then I will breathe into it, and it will be a bird by okay. the name of God. Now, I'm going to ask you a question before you finish. When Allah created man from clay, how did he make man alive? By breathing into him, right? That's right. Why is it Jesus creates exactly like your God? Because here it says, like Allah, Jesus created from clay. But he created a bird, Allah created a man. But like Allah, Jesus breathed into that bird of clay and made it alive like Allah did with Adam. How is it that Allah is allowing Jesus to create exactly the same way that Allah creates? Um, yeah, so this this is uh, one of the miracles of uh, Jesus. But That's not my um, question, this, this James. Is... James, you're not listening. See, I know, I know it's a miracle. You're not listening. Let me try it again.
Yeah. Why is Allah allowing Jesus to create and give life exactly like Allah does and for no one else? I know it's a I'm miracle. Not sure why, yeah, I'm not sure why he allowed Jesus to uh, do this miracle, uh, but it doesn't mean that Jesus is God. I didn't, I didn't ask you what it means. What I'm going to ask you to do is show me someone other than Allah and Jesus in your Quran creating and giving life by the power of their breath. There's no one who... Who does that except Jesus? Okay, so Allah Jesus made Allah. Jesus his partner in his power to create and breathe out life. Um, no, he didn't make him his partner. He just gave him the miracle of Wait, 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 hold on. It says that he created. Oh, 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 no, you're not. He created from clay, breathed life into it by Allah's permission. So who permitted Jesus to create exactly the way Allah creates? Allah. And you're saying that's not because Allah made him a partner. Then you're saying he's a separate being who does what he wants independently from Allah? Um, yeah, yes, he's a, he's yes, he's a, a separate, separate being who does what he wants independently from Allah. Oh, wow, interesting. I'm glad you said that. We got you recorded. Now finish it. After he creates him from clay and breathes into him life, what else does he do? I will also heal the blind and the leper and bring to life the dead by the leave of God. Now, can you show me, you. before you move on, can you show me someone other than Allah and Jesus that brought life to the dead by raising the dead, according to your Quran? No, this this is a miracle given only to Jesus. Only Jesus. So wait, let's see the miracles. Jesus is the only one pure from the womb, only one who creates from clay and breathes life into the clay exactly like Allah, the only one who gives life to the dead, the only one in your Quran who gives sight to the blind and cleanse lepers. Allah does so much only for Jesus and for no one else, and yet Jesus is simply a man like Muhammad. Yeah, I'm convinced. You convinced me right now. And Jesus is the only one born of a virgin, right? That's right. Oh, but Adam was created by mother and father. Are you going to use that pathetic argument? Uh... No, Adam is the first man. So okay. He was, ah. Uh, so Adam had to be created special, right? Because he didn't have any parents? That's right. So then why did God interrupt the process of sexual reproduction in order to have Jesus be born of a virgin without a man? Why do that for Jesus? Why do all these things for Jesus? From, from what I understand, it's for him to be pure. Oh, so you're saying someone who's conceived sexually is impure, huh? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, according like, yeah, according to a like a hadith, it says that, um, like Jesus, Jesus was never uh touched by Satan, not only Jesus, so, neither his mother. Um, okay. yes, it does. Bukhari yeah, so Muslim, Jesus, it says Mary and her son were not touched by Satan, yes. Yeah, so, Jesus, uh, peace be upon him, was he's he can't sin because he was he was born pure, uh, but it says his mother too was not touched by Satan. So was she born of a virgin too? Uh, no. Okay, so then why was Jesus born of a virgin and yet his mother wasn't born of a virgin, but she too is pure and Satan didn't touch her? Um, I, I don't know exactly why Jesus... Exactly you don't. You know why? Virgin. You know why you don't know? Because you gave up God's true word, the Holy Bible, that has the answer. But I'm not going to go there. What I want to do is I want to stick here. You said Jesus, peace be upon him. Now, according to the Quran, read 4158. 4158. Because okay. you said peace be upon him. Okay. Sure. Okay, now so, read for me 4158. Okay, so, um, oh, just give me one sec. Sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a second. Take your time. Okay, so this is uh, 4158. Yes. Rather, God raised him up to himself, and God is almighty, all wise. Okay, where did where did Allah take Jesus? Uh, Allah took him up to himself. Okay, now, where is your Allah, according to the Quran? In heaven. Is he in heaven or above the seven heavens? Because you have seven heavens, not one. That's right. So he's um, above the seven heavens. And where is he, on the throne or above the throne? I, I believe he's on the throne. Okay, so Allah is above the seven and is on the throne, right? That's right. 
And you just said Allah took Jesus to himself. So you just admit Jesus is with Allah on the throne. Good job. Read it again, 4158. Where is Jesus? Uh, rather, God raised him up to himself. To himself. He didn't say yeah. raised him to heaven. Where I am, Jesus is with me. What is your Jesus doing with Allah on the throne for 2,000 years? And if he's uh, there, why do you need to say peace be upon him? Does he need your peace? Yes, it's... Um, what? He needs your peace even though he's with Allah? Um, no, but it's just... It's just, no, um, it's just what we say. Okay, but who told you to say to that? Respect. Can you show me in the Quran where it says, "Say to Jesus, peace be upon him"? No, it doesn't say that in the Quran. But um, so, how but dare you, saying, James? How dare you yeah. insult your Jesus, Isa, who's already with Allah on the throne? He couldn't be in any more perfect peace than in the state he is already. He doesn't need you to pray for his peace. He's in perfect peace with your God on the throne. Okay, uh, may I say something? Sure. Um, uh, Allah says in the Quran that um, like he confers uh, blessings upon the Prophet. No, it doesn't say he blessings, it says he prays for the Prophet. So. He prays for the Prophet, not blessings. But yeah, because your Prophet is dead and buried. He needs you to pray him out of hell. Jesus, we're told, is with Allah. Can you show me where it says your Prophet is with Allah? No, our Prophet is... Your it, Prophet is where? Heaven, but it's not with Allah. Okay, but so... Don't tell me a verse where it says, Allah prays for your prophet and the angels. That's your prophet. He needs your prayers because he's in bad shape. But your Quran says Jesus is with Allah. So why do you need to pray for Jesus? And show me where it says pray for Jesus. Um, it doesn't say that, but it's implied exactly. that we... That we uh, where does it imply it, James? Don't give me your okay, thoughts. Because, but, yeah, so in the verse about the prophet, about Prophet Muhammad, it says to confer blessings on him. And since Jesus is also a prophet, we confer blessings. No, upon, that's not. That's upon. a pathetic logic because your prophet needs you to pray for him because your prophet didn't know what was going to happen to him according to your Quran. But I just showed you your Quran says Jesus is with Allah. Why do you need to pray for his peace? Um, he doesn't. He doesn't need us to pray for. His yes, peace. you do. Yes, he does. Go to chapter forty-six, verse nine. Because your prophet didn't know what Allah was going to do with him. Go to 46 verse 9. Yes, he does. That's why I told you to pray for me. 46 verse 9. Okay, sure. Um, say, I am not the first messenger ever sent, nor do I know what will happen to me or you. I only follow what is revealed to me, and I am only sent with a clear warning. Nor, will I, nor do I know what will happen to who? To to Muhammad, this is about Muhammad, but it, okay. it doesn't say anything about. Can you show uh, me where Jesus says, "I don't know what's going to happen to me"? No, uh, Jesus never said that. But your prophet says, "I'm commanded to tell you, I don't know what else is going to do with me or you. I just follow what's inspired." So, can you show me where in the Quran Muhammad was inspired <clears throat> to tell you, "Hey, Jesus needs your prayers like I need your prayers." See, I need your prayers. And Jesus needs them too. No, there's no like exactly. specific verse about Jesus. Exactly. But, um, may I ask a question? Like sure. for this verse. Yes. For this verse, how did how did you get that um, this was about uh, Muhammad going to hell or? I didn't um, ask. I didn't say how did I get. I said, does he say he doesn't know what's going to happen to him? Yeah, he doesn't. Know and what's, then what's gonna... when you go to 1971, it says everyone goes to hell, and only the God fearing come out. Go to 19, chapter 19, verses 71 and 72. Okay, so... Um, and please don't the read a mistranslation of that. If that Khadib guy is, I'm going to burn his Quran if it's mistranslation. Go to 19, 71 and 72. Okay. There is none of you who will not pass over it. This is and it doesn't say pass over it. Wariduha means there's none of you who shall not enter into it. Into, into what? But read your translation so you can see how your translation deceived you. There's none of you who will not pass over it. Keep reading. This is a decree your Lord must fulfill. Then we will deliver those who are devout, leaving the wrongdoers there on their knees. Relieving the wrongdoers there where? In hell. Okay, so wait. When it says pass over it, that's the unbelievers and believers who will pass over it. But if pass over it means you don't enter it, then how did the unbelievers end up there hobbling 
instead of Allah taking them out. And then it says Allah will take out those who are God-fearing. So according to your Quran, everyone enters hell, the righteous and the wicked. Only the God-fearing come out and the unbelievers stay there. Does that include your prophet? Because he's talking to your prophet and to the Muslims and the unbelievers. There's not one of you. He's talking to Muhammad and everyone there. That includes your prophet too, right? Yeah, that includes all prophets. Everyone no, it doesn't too. include all prophets. You just read Jesus is with Allah. Are you lying to me? No, but Jesus still needs to be judged according to the Quran. Not according to 4158. He's already with Allah. So let me ask you the question again. According to 1971-72, talking to your prophet and the people at that time, there's not one of you who will not enter hell. So does your prophet go to hell? I can't answer that. Yes, you can. And now, in light of that, your prophet needs your prayers because he doesn't know what Allah is going to do to him. And later on, Allah says, every one of you, you, Muhammad, the believers and unbelievers, you're all going into hell. And only the god fearing are coming out. But your Quran says Jesus is with Allah. So unless your Allah is in hell, Jesus ain't going to hell. Okay, so um, like um, uh, this, um, this, these verses could mean the, um, the Muslims that Allah was revealing the, the verses to. And it doesn't necessarily mean... Um, the prophet because no he um, didn't say necessarily not mom it says not one of you who's he talking to muhammad and the contemporaries of muhammad nice try though no, uh, a, a nice try no, but if, yeah but um if you like the, the context like suggests that it's talking about the people who deny the resurrection no it's not because it says he's going to bring out the god fearing why are the god fearing denying the god uh, the resurrection read 72 then we will Deliver those who are devout, leaving the wrongdoers. Why would the, the devout need to be delivered if they're not in hell? And how can you say it's referring to those who deny the resurrection when the devout don't deny the resurrection, they believe it? That's right. Um, yeah. Exactly. Go to 69 of your Quran, 44 to 47. Okay, 69. 44. This is 44 to 47. Had the messenger made up something in our name, we would have certainly seized him by his right hand and severed his aorta. Then, then what would it say, aorta? Hold on, hold on, hold on. What? So, yeah, um, it says we would have certainly seized him by his right hand then severed his aorta. Okay, keep on. And none of you could have shielded him from us. Okay, so if Muhammad had made a lie, Allah would have cut off his aorta, right? Which is metaphorical means cause him to die a painful death, right? That's right. Now, according to your hadith, how did Muhammad die and what did he say? Um, I'm not sure exactly okay. how. Let me, let me, uh, well, I'm going to tell you uh, how. Died from, sorry, he died from old age. No, he didn't. Mm -hmm. According to your hadiths, and I'm going to give them to you, Muhammad died from the effects of poison. When the Jewish woman fed him a poisoned piece of land, he ate enough of it for the poison to linger in his body. And as he was dying, he says, Aisha, I feel my aorta being cut off from the poison of the lamb that the jewish woman fed me here he goes here you go so according to that hadith, your prophet died the death of someone damned to hell here you go read it click on it read it for us bukhari read it for me click on it and read it for me sure so the prophet uh, peace be upon him, in his ailment in which he died, used to say, Oh, Aisha, I still feel the pain caused by the food I ate at Tiber. And at this time, I feel as if... Why'd you stop? Has, wait, 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 why'd sorry. you stop? Read. Sorry, I just... Uh, yeah, you got shocked. Yeah. Read it again. I feel what? I feel as if my aorta is being cut from that poison. So why did you tell me he died of old age when your hadith says he died a miserable, shameful, humiliating death, the death of an accursed dog? Because your Quran said if he was a liar, Allah would cut off his aorta. And according to your prophet, that's what happened to him. And you were stupid enough to follow this man and give up the real Jesus and the real word of God, the Bible. I feel sorry for you, man. Let me, let me do you a favor. We've talked enough. Lord willing, if you want to come back tomorrow and we talk about who Jesus claimed to be, we can talk about that. So if you're interested, 
We'll talk about who Jesus claimed to be. Because enough about Muhammad, this wicked tool of the devil who deceived you. May Jesus save you, who loved you enough to die for you, not deceive you into following a pervert. Go back, rewatch this, rewatch this session, and read the articles. And if you want, call me tomorrow, and we're going to just talk about who Jesus claimed to be, nothing else. If you're interested, contact me, all right? Okay, sure. All Sounds right, buddy. Good. Take care, and we'll be praying for you, James, that Jesus brings you to the truth. Take care. Okay, thank you. Bye. Pray for this young man. His name is James Arnhem. James Arnhem, A-R-N-H-E-M. You see he went silent when he read the Hadith? You saw he got shocked, right? He's listening, by the way. There's the Hadith. Anyway, guys, I didn't want to overwhelm him. It's already been two hours. So pray for him. May he call me tomorrow, and we'll talk about Jesus and how beautiful Jesus is. Okay? Now, with that said, are you blessed or what? What an amazing opportunity Jesus gave us again. Another person that the Lord Jesus brought by the power of the Holy Spirit in order to use imperfect vessels, sinners like me, to share with him the truth and destroy Muhammad, the son of the devil, destroy Allah, who was the devil, deceiving Muhammad into thinking he was God, and destroy the Quran for the glory of Jesus. We had a blessed week. We had an Orthodox Jew who heard truth from the Tanakh that God is triune, and he manifested. May God save him. And now this young man, his name is James Arnhem. A-R-N-H-E-M. Save the links to all the material. Lord willing, I have to go somewhere. Later, I'll put the links in the description box, and I'm going to have to retitle this. What a beautiful session. What a beautiful God. What a beautiful Father in heaven. What a beautiful Savior, the Lord Jesus. And what a beautiful Holy Spirit. And what a beautiful word, the Holy Bible. The Bible is real. It is living, active, because it's the living word of the living God who is real. And Jesus is alive. May he cause us to be in love with him, to worship him, obey him, fear him. May he give me the health I need to continue to do this until he takes me home. May the Lord Jesus bless you to be bold as lions and lionesses, not afraid of anything and anyone but him. May he fill us with the spirit, provide for the ministry, bring my daughters to me. We love you and worship you, Lord Jesus, Son of God. Bring James back home and heal his parents' heart. Thank you, Son of God. We love you, Maranatha. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. I love you guys. Lord willing, see you tomorrow. Christ is risen, risen indeed.